Hi, today we're going to talk about plant pests. Our learning objectives for today are to be able to learn about plant pests and the symptoms that they cause. Explain the disease triangle and its three components. You'll also be able to explain integrated pest management and the benefits. You'll also be able to describe the general biology of bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And you'll learn about parasitic weeds and be able to explain the difference between hemiparasitic and holoparasitic. Plants are dealing with a lot of stress every day. That can be abiotic, otherwise known as non-living, such as temperature, harsh temperatures, too hot or too cold, wind, hail, snow, etc. Or they can be biotic. Think of the things that cause diseases in humans, such as bacteria, fungus, and viruses. Biotic, or living plant pests, is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about viruses, bacteria, fungus, insects, snails, nematodes, weeds. All of these things are plant pests. Pests are any undesirable organism that is injurious to the plant, either directly, such as an insect eating the leaf, or a fungus breaking down and causing decay in a plant, or indirectly, such as the damage caused by weeds. The weed basically gets into the soil and steals the nutrients from the plant, thus harming the growth of that plant. That's indirect harm. So what happens when plants get sick? Did you know that plants get sick too? Just like us, plants can get infected with a bacteria, virus, or fungus that causes disease to that plant, or insects. But what needs to happen for plants to get sick? A lot of plants are growing healthy all the time, even though they're interacting with bacteria and fungus and viruses all the time, and many insects. The reason that plants don't get sick very often is because three important things all have to occur at the same time in order for that plant to get sick. We make a graphic to explain this as plant pathologists, and it's called the disease triangle. Let's learn about the three components. The plant needs to be susceptible meaning that it, it can get that disease. The pest must be present, and the proper environment must occur. The environment that benefits the pest just as much as the plant. So this is the disease triangle. We have our host. The host plant must be susceptible to the pathogen. The pathogen must be present and must be able to overcome the plant defenses. Plants have many defense mechanisms to deter pathogen invasion. The pathogen must be able to overcome this to be able to infect. And the environment must tip the balance in favor of the pathogen. If you have all three of these, disease will occur. Plants are exposed to countless microbes, but very, very few of these interactions lead to disease. Why? Because all three things have to occur. And plants have incredible immune systems. Let's review. First, we have to have the host, we have to have the pathogen that's virulent or able to overcome the plant defenses, and the environment has to be just right for the disease to occur. So how do we prevent disease from occurring, or how do we prevent pest damage? Well, we can start with controlling. The best way to control plant diseases is plant resistance. Plant genetic resistance is plants that have immunity to the pest. It's so the best way to control the pest because we don't have to add anything and the plant has that genetic resistance, meaning that it's always able to resist that specific pathogen. This is an example of a plant that's resistant versus one that's susceptible. This is another example of a crown rust um, invasion of this plant and this one is resistant and this one is susceptible. So in this field, the environment is just perfect for the crown rust to develop, but this plant is resistant and this plant is susceptible. We can also manage the environment of our plant so that the environment does not favor the pest. We want the environment to be favorable for the plant and unfavorable for the pest. You can do this by reducing the moisture around certain vegetable crops, or making sure that you water your plant when it's not going to be, um, the leaves aren't going to be wet for a really long time. So you want to water below, not spraying all the leaves to get all the leaves wet. That can um, increase the likelihood of 
fungal invasion of your leaves. You can also eliminate the pest, such as the um, enforcement of a quarantine. So this graphic shows that you may be just bringing some fruit in from another country or a different state, but this could be carrying a disease. So a lot of times it's um, prohibited to carry fruit into, uh, across borders, and that is because there could be pathogens and you don't want to be moving one pathogen to a new area. So quarantines are usually imposed by a government. Um, you can also do sanitation, so you can wash your pots and tools, um, keep the hoses off the ground, propagate clean plants, etc., so that you can prevent the spread of disease. You also can do physical control, such as bug traps, screens, sticky boards, etc. Another way to control pests is biological control. This is the use of one organism to control another organism. So let's talk about these two pictures we have. This is a fungal organism and another fungus. See, fungus um, are co are co-inhabiting the soil, and they develop mechanisms to be able to fight each other off. So this is um, a fungus that you could use to prevent the growth of a disease. This is a bacteria that I used to work with in my master's study that has the ability to produce this orange pigment called a phenazine, and that phenazine can actually be secreted by the bacteria into its environment, and then it can kill fungus in that same environment. This white version of the bacteria that does not produce the orange pigment is not able to kill the fungus. That's what that is showing here. So let's go over some examples of biological control. Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria that controls caterpillars. Predaceous mites eat other mites and small insects. Parasitic wasps lay eggs inside other insects, killing them, preventing the pathogen invasion. Trichoderma, a fungus that controls other fungi. Pseudomonas chlorephus, bacteria that controls fungi. So this is Pseudomonas chlorephus. You can also use pesticides to control pathogens. You can use chemicals to control pests, such as fungicide, bactericide, insecticide, miticide, and herbicide. Different, different pesticides have different modes of action. Let's go over the mode of action of glyphosate, which is, a, which is round, known as Roundup, weed killer. And let's go over the mode of action of Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt for short. Glyphosate prevents plants from growing. So glyphosate is used widely in um, large-scale crop production to kill weeds. The way that they get around that um, doesn't kill the actual crop is because they have been genetically engineered to um, not be affected by glyphosate. So glyphosate, as I said, prevents the plant from producing aromatic amino acids. Aromatic amino acids, along with all the other amino acids, are essential building blocks of life. So if the plant is not able to build those, it's not able to live. So there's a biosynthetic pathway within plants that takes sh um, shikimic acid and converts it all the way down to three aromatic amino acids. They're shown here. This is what they look like. Humans do not have shikimic pathway, so we do not produce these three within our cells. How glyphosate works is it stops the ESPS synthase action, so basically shikimic acid cannot be converted into these three important amino acids. So glyphosate stops this synthesis and then inhibits the plant growth, thus killing the plant. Glyphosate um, this mode of action of glyphosate shouldn't be harmful to humans because we don't have this shikimic pathway. Let's go over the mode of action of Bt, or Bacillus thuringiensis. So this is a bacteria that kills caterpillars. The toxin, Bt toxin, attaches to the gut of the cells of the insect. It punctures holes within the gut of the insect, um, and then thus causing leaking of the insect and the thus the caterpillar dies. So let's go over this again. In the insect, the toxin first activated by enzymes in the gut. Once activated, the Bt toxin binds to highly specific sites in the insect gut. These binding sites allow the Bt toxin to form pores in the gut cells, leading to the death of the cells and eventually the whole insect. The guts of humans and other mammals are different from the susceptible insect. 
the human gut is high in acid and therefore the beta toxin can't become soluble or activated. And the human gut lacks the specific receptors needed to bind the Bt toxin. Without binding, pores are not formed. So we don't have to worry about Bt hurting humans. So again, there's these receptors within the insect gut. The Bt goes to those, basically opening a door that allows leakage within the gut of the insect, and thus leakage of um, the contents of the gut, resulting in the death of the caterpillar. And this is how Bt toxin works. Pesticides have different modes of action. There's some pesticides that are contact pesticides, such as um, used for killing insects and weeds. There's systemic pesticides, meaning that once it touches part of the plant, it gets basically into the system of the plant and moves it uh, around. Um, these can also be used to kill insects and weeds. And there's um, stomach poison, which is specifically a mode of action like BT, BT that's for insects killing only. The challenge with pesticides is many pesticides are used widespread. This can be a problem because if one plant develops resistant to this um, pesticide, this specific mode of action, it can become a huge issue for farmers. And this is something that's already happening. These are examples of plants that are resistant to some pesticides. To prevent this from happening, we want to use pesticides sustainably um, not on all of our field, and we want to um, possibly use pesticides with multiple modes of action, because if one um, plant develops resistant to the one mode of action, it, won't, it might be killed by the other mode of action. All of these plants are resistant to Roundup or glyphosate, such as giant ragweed or palmer amaranth. Integrated pest management is what we're going to cover next, or IPM. This is the use of all the strategies of pest damage control, resistance, cultural, biological, environmental, and chemical, to minimize the economic impact of pests. Basically, we're not just using one mode of action of preventing the pest or controlling it. We're using multiple to form this integrated pest management system so that we have less likelihood of um, disease resistance occurring within our pest population and also managing in a more sustainable way. Let's talk about these specific pests now. We're going to go over some examples of types of pests such as insects, arachnids, nematodes, mollusks, pathogen, microorganisms, and weeds. So let's go over what an insect is. An insect is characterized by six legs, three body regions, head, thorax, abdomen, one pair of antennae, and wings. Insects, especially the Homothera order, are very con common insect pests on horticulture crops. They're characterized by sucking mouth parts. They, ext they extract phloem sap. As we covered before, phloem is what's in phloem is the sugar that the plant has worked really hard through the process of photosynthesis to create, and these insects come and just steal it, the life juices of the plant. Not good. Another characterization, another character of insects in the Homothera order are the secretion of honeydew. This is a sugary liquid secreted by the Homothera. Um, basically, can all, this honeydew can cause more issues such as the invasion of fungal pathogens. So, for example, is sooty mold. It's a black or brown mold that grows on honeydew on the leaf surfaces. It does not necessarily infect the plant, but it can um, cause the plant to get less sunlight because basically the insect came it got the um, plant all full of its honeydew, and then the fungus grows. It's caused by secretion of honeydew from aphids, mealybugs, scale, and whitefly. Aphids. These are a huge pest to horticulturists and agronomists alike. They have sucking mouth parts, they have small soft bodies, they're usually green, black, or brown, and interestingly, farm, uh, interestingly ants can actually farm aphids. Aphids can cause huge damage, especially in um, soybean crops. They can infect a wide range of crops. Um, aphids, however, can be controlled with um, another organism, and that is ladybugs. Ladybugs like to eat aphids. Another insect is mealybugs. Here's these little fuzzy guys. Um, they have sucking mouth parts, soft bodies covered with cottony wax filaments. Scale. 
is another insect. It has sucking mouth parts and covered by a hard shell. And white flies. They have sucking mouth parts and they are basically these translucent ovals underneath the leaves. Um, and the adults are small white flies. And thrips. Thrips have caused huge issues in some of my research projects, so I have a special hate for them. They have rasping sucking mouth parts. They cause lesions on the young leaves and flower petals. They basically, um, like these other insects that we talked about, are sucking the life juices out of the plant. So they make the plant even use more water, um, get dried out faster, and cause huge damage. A leaf miner is an interesting organism. It, has, it makes um, these, basically it travels within the leaf um, and it causes these um, trails that have gone through the leaf and the damage looks like this. Um, they bore these manding tunnels through the leaf and cause damage. And caterpillars. Caterpillars have these chewing mouth parts and eat whole tissue and they leave droppings. So if you find that they, your tomato plant or other vegetable has been eaten, you might find the caterpillar poop. You might not see the caterpillar exactly at that time when you're in your garden, but you'll find the poop. And grubs and borers. Um, they're the larvae of beetles and they feed on roots and they can also bore within a stem. It's a huge issue if they bore within the stem because the stem will become uh, less sturdy and can fall over in not even that strong of winds. So huge problems caused by grubs and borers. And beetles. These um, guys have chewing mouth parts and eat whole tissue causing this like kind of cool design in leaves but huge damage to the horticulturist. And grasshoppers have chewing mouth parts, they eat whole tissue, they can cause huge damage. Weevils are an interesting organism. They have this cute little noggin here. They mostly feed on stored grain. This can be a huge issue if you just harvested your grain. They can cause lots of damage by eating that grain. Next we're going to talk about arachnids. Mites, um, class arachnids, mites, spiders, ticks, scorpions. They're characterized by eight legs, two body regions, and no antenna or wings. Spider mites can come in a wide variety of colors. These three colors, tan, yellow, raspberry red. These little guys crawl in the leaf. Uh, they're very small. They're really hard to see, actually. Um, they cause a fine yellow speckling on the leaves. So if you find these speckles on the leaves, that can be a sign that you have spider mites. Um, these, these speckling on the leaves happen when they feed and they form webs uh, when they're severe. Nematodes or eel or wireworms are extremely small. These are microscopic organisms. You can see this microscope image of this nematode entering the root. These um, cause a lot of damage but they're unseen because people don't necessarily usually dig up the roots when they're seeing a pathogen problem. This is um, what root knot nematodes can cause the root to develop. So it bores into the roots and causes the root to have a swollen, knotted appearance. So this is a healthy root, and this is a root infected by nematodes. Mollusks, such as snails and slugs, can also cause severe plant damage. Snails are the ones with shells, and they chew on young plant parts, soft tissues, and they leave a slime trail. Slugs do not have a shell, and they chew on young plant parts, soft tissues, and they also leave a slime trail. Now let's talk about pathogens. Microorganisms invade, infect, and cause damage to another living organisms. We'll start with fungi. Fungi are long, multicellular, filamentous microorganisms composed of membrane-bound cells surrounded by cell walls. So this is what, um, this is a petri dish with fungal growth on it, and if you zoom in, this is what it looks like. So you see these multicellular organisms, you can see the individual cells um, separated by cell walls, and as the fungal grows, it grows by the tip, so the tip is expanding. Sometimes you'll have um, a branching off, and fungus grow in this circular way because the hyphae are all going in different directions and to eat um, the um, media, what's put in this, pe um, this petri dish. So a bunch of hyphae, cells of fungi, form mycelium. So this is a mycelium mat made up of a bunch of hyphae. Fungal infections on plants can look a lot different. Um, they can have this like powdery experience or can cause necrosis, which is death of certain 
um, cells in the leaf that causes this. It's called necrosis. Fungi can also cause um, different issues. So this is stem rust pathogen, and you can see that basically the, um, the fungus has infected this plant, and it's basically erupting the stem with the spores of the fungus. So this is how the fungus spreads um, and causes huge damage to wheat. This fungus is attacking the corn kernels. Um, so you can see this. This is actually not only causing um, damage to the corn, but it also produces a toxin within that infection that can cause um, harm to humans or animals that eat that corn. Next we'll talk about bacteria. Unlike fungi, bacteria are single cellular, but they work in groups to form disease. They're usually rod shaped, specifically the ones that infect plants most often are usually rod shaped. They're single cell um, and they're composed of a membrane bound cell surrounded by a cell wall. So this is a bacteria. Inside you have the DNA, outside you have the cell wall, flagellum, which are used to propel the, the bacteria, and pili, which um, help with mobility, but also just general attachment to other things. Bacteria come in many different shapes and sizes, um, different colors, um, different ability to produce pigments that can um, in affect the plant or the environment that that bacteria is in. This is a video that I want you to watch. Um, it is about flagella and the movement, how, how bacteria um, get around. So very cool motor function of flagella. Bacteria um, reproduce through division. And so you can see in this movie that one bacteria can quickly become many bacteria because one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, and so on. So it can divide extremely fast. So then just one bacteria and one drop of water on the leaf um, can start reproducing quite fast and can cause invasion. So bacteria are single cells, but they work together in groups to form diseases or do other things such as help the, back, uh, help the plant. So bacteria can also be good along with fungus can also be good too. Um, there's this uh, graphic of different shapes of bacteria, many different shapes. This is some nasty diseases that bacteria can cause um, on plants. You can have this soft, mushy, odorous region of the leaves or stems, this rot of this potato called a soft rot, um, or sometimes called I'll say, circular ringed lesions. This is, looks like nasty goo on this um, lettuce. These are some examples of bacteria invasion. Bacteria, um, specifically Xanthomonas, can cause a really bad um, bacteria infection in bananas. Also, um, this is um, a corn plant or maize infected with bacteria leaf stripe. Also another important plant um, disease. Next, we'll talk about viruses. So viruses um, are a microorganism. We can't see them with our eyes. We need to see them with um, usually electron microscope. They, um, unlike bacteria and fungus, are not able to reproduce unless they have a host. Uh, viruses are composed of strands of nucleic acid surrounded by a protein coat. Usually they can be rod shaped, spherical, crystalline shaped, many different shapes. Um, and again, they need a host to reproduce. They cannot reproduce on their own. This is some important um, symptoms that you'll see of viruses. A lot of times you'll see this mosaic, which is actually really beautiful on this clover plant. Um, these um, kind of like target shaped um, lesions, circular, um, or just, just general like curling of this plant. Um, cassava is a really important um, plant, mostly in tropical regions, counting for the third most um, source of calories, very important plant. Cassava mosaic virus is the most important pathogen that affects cassava. So cassava is a very important plant around the world for feeding people, and cassava mosaic virus is the most important pathogen. So a huge deal for um, preventing famines. Um, infected plants frequently produce no tubers, which is a big deal because that's what you eat of cassava. This is, um, we talked earlier about ways to control diseases, and the best way is through resistant cultivars. So resistant cultivars 
have been developed for Cassava mosaic virus. This is the resistant one, and this is one susceptible one. So you can see the susceptible one is much smaller, have this like curling of the leaves, but the resistant varieties um, have genes conferring resistance, and they're able to um, overcome the virus. Next, we're going to talk about weeds. Weeds are any plant, plant that's out of place. So if you have this big garden, you have a bunch of weeds growing, um, even if that plant might not even be a weed, usually considered a weed, uh, you might want to remove it. So why are weeds bad? It's because of these eight different reasons. They cause competition where that plant is being grown. So they compete for water and nutrients. Allopathy. Expense. It can be expensive to remove the um, weeds. Allopathy basically means that that plant can send signals that can cause your plant to grow differently. So plants produce a lot of different chemicals. Those chemicals affect the growth, not only of themselves, but the plants around them. Um, the weeds can also be a host to, for disease and insects, so the insects can get on the weeds and then spread to your plant. They can also contaminate foods, such as if you're growing a bunch of lettuce um, and then you harvested them, you accidentally harvested the weeds, that would reduce the quality of that. They can also be poisonous, such as stinging metal or um, poison sumac or poison oak, poison ivy, so that can be also a problem. And they can be aesthetically undesirable, say if you have a beautiful landscape with a bunch of weeds, that's not, um, that's not nice. They can also be parasitic, um, meaning that they can steal the life juices of that plant, and we'll go through two examples of that. An example of a parasitic weed is daughter. Um, daughter infects different plants by attaching to it and sucking the nutrients out of it. So these, do these plants are, um, parasitic weeds are so lazy, they don't develop their own root system. Instead, they attack a plant and steal um, phloem, they can steal phloem, or they can st and steal water from that plant. Mistletoes uh, are another parasitic plant, so again they don't have their own root, they attach to uh, a tree and they steal water from that plant, so they don't have their own root system to gather water, they steal it. So parasitic plants can either be hemiparasitic or holoparasitic. Hemiparasitic obtain water and mineral nutrients from the host plant, but they do photosynthetic have the photosynthetic processes to some degree. An example is mistletoe. They are still photosynthesized on their own, but they do steal uh, water and nutrients. Holoparasitic, on the other hand, are parasitic plant that derives all of its fixed carbon from the host plant, commonly lacking chlorophyll. Holoparasitic are often colors other than green. So for example, that daughter that was real yellow, that is stealing not only water and nutrients, but also photosynthetics photosynthates, so stealing all of the carbon that that plant worked hard for. So they are worse parasites. So in summary, today we covered that plants get sick too, and we covered a lot of different pests and control methods. There are different treatment methods, but the best is genetic resistance and avoidance, and also integrated pest management. Healthy plants with good microbiomes, meaning that they have healthy microorganisms growing on them, are less likely to get sick and maintain healthy growing conditions, and healthy soil is vital. So if you want a healthy plant, you want to make sure that the environment that it's growing in is healthy, it has good soil microbes, so that those microorganisms can act as biological control to kill pathogenic organisms. You also want to make sure the plant has enough nutrients, because that's important for keeping its uh, ability to defend against organisms healthy. Just like you, you're less likely to get sick if you're eating healthy and getting enough rest. You'll be able to, um, now that we've covered all of these different subjects, you'll be able to list the types of plant pests and the symptoms that they cause. You'll be able to explain the disease triangle, make sure you know those three components, and explain integrated pest management and the benefits of it. You'll also be able to describe the general biology of bacteria, fungi, and viruses, and describe what parasitic weeds are, and explain the difference between hemiparasitic and holoparasitic. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.